Please forgive me if I croak. <laughs> I've just had a minor stroke. Oh. Basal ganglion on the right makes me walk as if I'm tight. <laughs> so if my voice descends to squawking, Sam will have to do the talking. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. This is what a sold out house looks like when the Cubs are in the seventh game of the World Series. There's a place in hell for those people who <laughs> bought tickets and didn't use them. Needless to say, it's an honor to be here and a real honor to be doing this with Richard. And I, I get to do this twice in one week. This is the second night, that I think you know. And Richard and I were worried about this. We were worried about this event because we thought we would have a great conversation last night, and then we didn't want to spend an hour in front of you here trying to recapitulate that conversation. So as a way of avoiding that fate, I went out to all of you, I think, online asking for questions, and I got thousands of questions. And I picked many. So the, the questions we'll track through tonight are different from the ones we did last night, and this is all being videotaped, and, and you can see what you missed last night once that video is available. But, and I, I wasn't actually planning to ask this, but I, I wanted to talk about your stroke, because we haven't spoken about this. And I'm going to guess that the sock choice is not evidence of your stroke. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was explaining l last night that at the recent um, Skeptics Conference in, in Las Vegas, we had a workshop on cold reading, which you know that system where, whereby you, you, you pretend to thought read, and all you're doing really is sizing the other person up. And um, my partner was a young woman who said, I seem to see there's something wrong with your eyes. Maybe colorblind. <laughs> she was looking at my, at my, <laughs> so, so. I, I, it, it, I am trying to make a point. I'm trying to spread the meme of odd socks. <laughs> now, this is, this is not for the reason given in Stephen Potter's lifemanship, under, under womanship. He recommends the odd socks ploy as a way of arousing the maternal instincts. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then there's a footnote that says, buy our patent odd socks brand. <laughs> but my point is different from that. It is that um, we should not be compelled to buy socks in pairs, because unlike shoes, which have genuine chirality, you can't switch a left shoe and a right shoe. Socks do not have this property, and therefore it's, ri it's ridiculous having to buy socks in pairs. <laughs> if, you, if you lose one sock, you have to throw the other one away. And so I want to make the point in as vivid a fashion as possible and encourage everybody to wear odd socks. <laughs> Tell us about the, the experience of, of having a stroke. OK. It, well, it, it was a bit scary. I, I just suddenly became aware that, I, that my left hand wasn't working. I couldn't pick things up. Or if I managed to pick something up, I couldn't let go of it again, hmm. which is sort of kind of scary. Uh, and I was sort of staggering about and not able to stand up straight. I couldn't drop buttons. Um, I think I'm pretty much recovered now. I can both do up and undo buttons. Th this was in February? Yes. Um, the only thing is, I can't sing. Uh, I never could sing very well, but I, but I, could, at least, I could at least sing in tune, and now I can't. Um, and my voice does tend to croak, so hence my introductory apology. What well, was there any immediate emotional or cognitive or perceptual component to it, or was it just a, a motor thing that you noticed? No, it was just, it was just motor. I mean, I was obviously scared. It, 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 it's in the basal ganglion, as, as I said, which, which doesn't affect cognitive function. So, mm. so um, I, 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 I hope that will become evident tonight that I'm not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will see if you come out as a Mormon at any point in the next hour. <laughs> I think it would take more than a stroke to do that to me. <laughs> Our first question 
that one of you may have asked. If you had a time machine and could travel 500 years into the future, what do you think you would find biologically, assuming our direct descendants still exist and haven't uploaded themselves into the matrix, <laughs> will we be recognizably human? 500 years is too short a time to expect any genetic evolutionary change. Of well, what about with our own meddling, the genetic engineering that we're That's surely going to do? Yes, I mean, it's, I, I suppose that, that is a possibility. If, if by then we've colonized Mars, such that there's uh, a, a barrier to gene flow between the parent planet Earth and, and the colony on Mars, then, then it's possible that, that, we, that the, the Mars colony might have diverged. Um, but 500 years is a short time. Mm. But h how much of an appetite do you think we will have, given what we currently are, to change ourselves, given the ability to do so in, in radical ways? Well, we've had the ability to change cows and horses and pigs and cabbages and dogs and roses uh, for hundreds, thousands of years. And although we've changed all those species almost beyond recognition, when you think that a, that a Pekingese or a poodle or a pug or a bulldog is a wolf, he still thinks it's a wolf. The world's worst wolf. Uh, and, and, and yet we haven't done that to humans. So it looks as though we, we don't seem to have had much of an appetite to do that with respect to the selection part of the Darwinian equation. Um, we're now just beginning to have the possibility of doing it to the mutation part of the Darwinian equation, namely mm. uh, genetic engineering. But it's not obvious why, if we didn't have the motivation to selectively breed humans, why we should have the motivation to selectively mutate humans. Kind of a, re a related point. You're very obviously very famous for having introduced this concept of a meme. How seriously should we take the analogy to a gene? with a meme? It, it, it was intended as an analogy to a gene. Um, and um, the, 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 the idea is that, that anywhere in the universe where self-replicating coded information arises, that could be fair game for Darwinian evolution, for Darwinian selection. And I wanted to end the selfish gene by making that point, because the whole of the rest of the book had been extolling the gene as the unit of selection. So I wanted to make the point, it doesn't have to be DNA. It could be anything which is self-replicating. Well, um, and it, it, one could speculate about life on other planets being mediated by a replicator other than DNA. But then I thought, or, or a computer virus would have done the job as well, but I didn't know about them in 1976. Um, so I thought, well, um, what about cultural inheritance? Anything where we have imitation is potentially analogous to genetic replication. So something like a craze at a school, uh, something like a craze for a, a particular kind of toy. I introduced to my boarding school a craze for origami paper folding to make a Chinese junk. And it spread like, exactly like a measles epidemic through the school and then died away like a measles epidemic. Interestingly, I had um, learned to do this from my father, and he had learned it from an almost identical epidemic at the same school 26 years earlier. <laughs> so the epidemiology of meme um, spread is very similar to gene spread. But it's only interesting from a Darwinian point of view if the memes that spread are the ones that are good at spreading, if there is some kind of selective effect, and it's plausible that it should be, um, clothes fashion spread because people find them cool or some, something like a reverse baseball cap, which, by the way, lowers the IQ by a full 10 points. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's probably the first remark that he's going to get in trouble for. <laughs> Encounter. Um, but uh, um, I, th I think you can probably treat uh, r religious memes in the same way. I mean, they, they, it's a re religious ideas spread like a virus. So I call them virus of the mind. So they either pass down the generations like, uh, like DNA does. And of course, obviously, religions pass down generations. <coughs> but they also spread sideways in epidemics uh, when you've got a particularly charismatic vector of the virus, like. Billy Graham or one of those um, types. So I think it's an, a genuinely interesting question whether 
the, the really successful religions like Roman Catholicism and Islam spread because the memes have high spreadability in their own right, like genes in Darwinism, or whether they're spread by Machiavellian priests who get together and work out what the, what's the best marketing strategy to spread them. And I'm inclined to think that, that, that pure mimetic spread is plausible, and I'm, I'm interested in, in that. I haven't really run very much with the meme idea. The people who have are Dan Dennett, the, the philosopher who talks in a very interesting way about memes in most of his recent books. And um, Susan Blackmore is another one who wrote a book called The Meme Machine. There are about, actually there are about 20 books now with the, with the word meme in the title, which emphasize various uh, aspects of it. The fact that memes don't change truly randomly, is that run roughshod over I the I don't think analogy? that really matters. Um, ge genes mutate randomly in the sense that they're not, mutation is not directed towards improvement. The only right. improvement comes from, from selection. Um, but um, the mutation nevertheless is, is induced by things like cosmic rays, radioactivity, various mutagenic chemicals. Um, the fact that memes are introduced by human creativity doesn't detract from the idea that some memes spread better than others for selective, mm. uh, for selective reasons. What do you think your most important contribution to science or culture at large has been or will be? I suppose the extended phenotype, um, which is the title of my second book. It's the only book that I wrote with a professional audience in mind. Um, I, I, I could expound it, but, but this is supposed to be a conversation, not a monologue, so, mm -hmm. so I... Um, well, I, I can, I mean, the question is for both of us, so, uh, so I, can, I can answer it, but... You can answer it. Well, okay, you do yeah. your answer first, then. Um, <laughs> I can tell you what I hope it will be. I, I, what I, I, I don't tend to think in these terms, kind of, this globally, but I, I think what I'm doing in most of the time and have done in most of my books is attempt to argue for the unity of knowledge and to resist this balkanization of our epistemology by essentially what I view as, as the dictates of university architecture. You know, the, the fact that there's the biology department over here where you study biology, and then there's the psychology department over there, that seems to articulate two separate spheres of inquiry that in the centers, you know, they, they do have different methods, but they, there really are no boundaries between those disciplines. And I see that as true for not just for canonical scientific disciplines, but just fact-based thinking about the nature of reality across the board. And also the, the distinction that people make between third-person facts, you know, classically physical facts, and first-person subjective facts. And some, some people make that, think that distinction is so hard and fast that they imagine there are no subjective facts. That, that I think, is a boundary that I am consciously trying to erode. And I, I think questions about moral truth and the, and the truth of possible human experience or, or the experience of, of conscious systems, those are, those are questions that are every bit as grounded in reality as any questions we ask in physics or chemistry or... So introspec introspection is a way of getting scientific data, do you, do you mean? Yeah, I mean, that's... Obviously, there are... You have to issue certain caveats there. I mean, there, there, are, there are ways in which introspection is a dead end. I mean, for instance, I can't tell, even with my best efforts, I cannot tell that I have a brain. That's a pretty big blind spot. <laughs> but there are many things you can, that you can introspect about which give you scientifically valid data. And in fact, you only, I mean, if you're, if you're studying the mind, if you're studying what it's like to be a person, at some point you are, you are correlating third person quote, objective methods with first-person report. You know, somebody says, you know, I ask you what it's like to have a stroke, or your, your neurologist does, and he needs to know what your experience is. I mean, it's, it's not, I mean, with a stroke, it's, it's the final analysis seems to be looking at your brain, at the, you know, actually what has been physically affected, but the cash value of those physical effects is always what is showing up in your experience and what's showing up in your function. So if some canonical language area, say, was affected, but you spoke fine and, and appreciated, understood language fine, and, and, and there was no discernible change in your language use, 
well then that would be the definition of those being non-linguistic areas of the brain being affected no matter how close they are to you know the, the standard you know averaged atlas of, of language use so we do always link up with a subjective report too and and first person performance and so yeah i mean in terms of the contribution i i want to make i want to argue that there's a a larger set of truth claims we want to make when we're reasoning about reality and those include things that we will never know. I mean, they, they include abstract things like mathematics, you know, which the physical foundation of which is kind of hard to specify. And they include the example I always use is you know, the question like, what was JFK thinking the moment before he got shot? Well, well we know we'll never know, and that's, that's data we will never get, but there's an infinite number of things we know he wasn't thinking, right? So that, it would be wrong to say he was thinking I wonder what Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins think about what I'm thinking right now before I get shot. <laughs> There's an infinite number of things we could, we could assert about his, the character of his subjectivity there, which we know are wrong. You know, and, those are, and we know that as, as fully as we know anything in, in science. And there are things that get, it's like, you know, like the, the mystery or pseudo mystery of how to integrate free will, our experience of free will with our scientific worldview, I think can be easily resolved if you can introspect with sufficient perspicacity and notice that you don't even have evidence for free will in your first person experience. I think that, that's, those are subjective data that are available. So there, there, are, there are ways to get access to interesting things through introspection, but they don't actually include the existence of your brain. Very hard to communicate to other people. Yeah, but I mean, that, that's true of many things that we, have, we don't begin to doubt. I mean, just imagine what it would be like if only 1% of the population had vivid dreams at night. So most of us just sleep like animals. There's nothing that it's like to be us for eight hours a, a night. But then some percentage of the population talk about traveling and meeting people and having all of these illogical encounters. Dreams would be much stranger, and many people would doubt their existence, but they would exist just as much as they and, and do And we doubt the, the sanity of people who had them, probably, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But did you answer, did you fully answer your question? It would be, do you want to say more about the extended phenotype? Oh, well, I'll try. Um, uh, I mean, what, what is a, pheno pheno tell phenotype people what a phenotype is. is. is, the, is the, the external, not sorry, external, the, the manifestation of, of, of genetic effects. And from a Darwinian point of view, the, gen of the, the, the phenotypic effects by which a gene is selected. So there'll, there'll be genes that affect um, wing size, eye color, hair color, intelligence, these are all phenotypic effects. Conventionally, phenotypic effects are confined to the body in which the gene sits. So genes exert their phenotypic effects by influencing embryonic, embryological processes. And so the shape of the body, the color of the body, the behavior of the body are all influenced by the genes inside the body. That's conventional phenotype. Extended phenotype is phenotypic effects of genes which, which are outside the body in which the gene sits. And the easiest examples to think of are artifacts, things like beaver dams, um, birds' nests. These are quite clearly phenotypes. They quite clearly influence the survival of the genes that make them. So a bird's nest is made by genes in the same limited sense, or not so limited sense, as the bird's tail and the bird's eyes and the bird's wings. And the, the nest contributes to the survival of the genes, which is what matters in the selfish gene view of life, just as surely as the wings and the tail of the bird contribute to the survival of the genes that made them. So although the nest is not a part of the bird's body, it is a part of the phenotype by which the genes lever themselves into the next generation. Well, if you buy that, and you, I think you have to, um, then effects that um, parasites have on hosts, there are numerous examples, fascinating, rather lurid examples of parasites which affect the behavior or the morphology of, their, of the host in such a way as to improve the survival of the parasite. Well, that means that parasites' genes are influencing host behavior and host morphology in the same kind of way as any gene influences phenotype. So 
when an animal is induced by, well, there's, a, there's, there's a thing called a brain worm, for example, which is, which is a worm that gets into to a fluke or a snail, or various things like, like that, and causes the, 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 the intermediate host, the snail or, or the fluke. Let's t t stick to snail. Causes a snail to be eaten by a sheep. So, actually, sorry, the, the, the brain worm is a fluke, and it gets into the, into the snail and causes the snail to be more likely to be eaten by a sheep. And it does so by moving into the eyes of the, of the snail and making the, the eyes pulsate in a sort of rather frightening way. Mm -hmm. um, and calling the attention of, a, of an animal like a sheep or a cow to eating the snail, which means that the parasite, the fluke, then gets into the next part of its life cycle. So the fluke genes are influencing the behavior of the snail, and the, the eyes of the, of, of the snail. The, the, the change in the snail is part of the phenotype of fluke genes, extended phenotype. And if you buy that, which is a sort of further step, then something like um, the bird song, so male bird song, which say influences female birds, actually it physically causes the ovaries of the female to swell. This, this does happen. The swelling of the ovaries of a female bird is extended phenotype of genes in the male, which make the male sing the song, which has this effect. So, the extended phenotype then becomes a way of looking at the whole of animal communication, um, where one animal influences the behavior of another. I have not done justice to the extended phenotype. <laughs> Read it. <laughs> so, what are the prospects that religion or something like it is part of our extended phenotype. Yes, I, I, I don't think I want to say that. No, I, I, I imagine you wouldn't. Um, well, in, in order to qualify as extended phenotype, it would be necessary that um, genes, well, you, say, say you took two, two preachers, hmm. um, one of whom was a very good preacher who, who recruited lots and lots of people into his church, another of whom wasn't. That could be extended phenotype, but only if there was a genetic difference between these two preachers, which caused one of them to be an effective recruiter, the other one not. That, that would be, but I don't think that's very likely to be true. Um, well, wait, wait a minute. Just, just to quite literally play devil's advocate here. <laughs> if there's a gene for religious enthusiasm or a set of genes for a susceptibility to that range of experience and a fundamental lack of intellectual honesty or a lack of concern that, that whether you're, what you're saying is true. So a, a, a increased capacity for self-deception and therefore deception of others, say. I mean, that, that seems to me yeah, I plausible. Think that, I think so that's that, this is a very effective preacher yes. who's filled with the, the charisma of being absolutely sure about what he's saying and energized by you know, his passion for the whole project. That, that's true, and, I, and I, I think it probably is true that there are, there's, there are genetic... When, when you say a gene for something, you, all you ever mean is, is, is a genetic difference that causes a phenotypic difference. So um, the best way to show that would be twin studies. If you can show that, with, that identical twins, monozygotic twins, if one of them is, is a religious maniac, the other one probably will be as well. If, if, that, if, if that's true, and if that's not so true of fraternal twins, dizygotic twins, then, then you've, you've shown that there is a genetic effect on, on religiosity. And, and that's probably true, and I think it's certainly true. To be extended phenotype, I think you've got to say that genes engineer their own survival and passing on into the next generation by um, making their victims religious. Mm. And I suppose, well, maybe, yes, maybe that works, actually. Uh, um, so uh, quickly, a life's work is undone. <laughs> yes, I mean, I, I suppose that... 
<laughs> Let's not go there, is it? <laughs> What do you think are the most misunderstood topics in science by otherwise smart and educated people? Or what, what's one that you think is, is often misunderstood? That oh, evolution, surely, is, 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 is especially in this, in this country, is... is um, <laughs> um, but what, what do you think, I mean, even many people in this room who obviously are well-educated and interested in the topic to, to even be here, what do you think many people here may be confused about or be wrong about and not know it that, that's of consequence in science? Have you had well, a um, I mean, that there's, certainly there are no creationists in this audience. You were screened at the door, right, with that <laughs> one? I suppose there may be people, I mean, I, w I would say it was a misconception to, um, to believe that the majority of evolutionary change as, a, as we observe it is non-selective. And there, there, there are people who believe that natural selection is relatively trivial um, compared to random, random genetic effects. Now, that, that's a genuine scientific controversy, and there may be people here who subscribe to that. And it's true, if you stick to molecular genetic changes, mm. but if you're talking about actual externally visible phenotypic changes, then I don't think it is true. And I think that, that's a confusion which I would expect to find in this sophisticated audience. So, so just to traverse that one more time, the belief that much of what we notice about ourselves was not selected for, but yes. just kind of came along for the ride, yes. you think that's very likely untrue? Yes, but, it, but you have to be sophisticated about it because you may be looking at the wrong thing. I mean, we talked about this last night. I, mm. Perhaps it doesn't matter doing it again. Um, there, man, many people think that, that quite a lot of characteristics are trivial, um, sort of frivolous. I mentioned eyebrows la last night as being something which nobody could seriously think that eyebrows are doing anything useful. How could eyebrows possibly be naturally selected for? Well, I think that, that's a mistake. It's a very, it's a very tempting mistake. but. Um, something that seems trivial is almost certainly not trivial because the genes that make it have so many opportunities to be selected. They are it's represented in thousands of individuals and over lots of generations. Um, and this has been worked out mathematically as well. So that, that is a very common misconception, I think, that, that um, very slight effects are too trivial for natural selection to care about. Um, and I think that is wrong. I think natural selection actually does care about even what look to us like very tiny, trivial effects. Mm. To uh, make a disconcertingly lateral move here, how can we publicly challenge the more dangerous tenets of Islam without further inspiring bigotry against Muslims? Now, you and I have both, both unlike many scientists, we have... We've sounded off on this. It, it's been, for as long as I've been an atheist, it's been deeply unfashionable amongst atheists, even atheists who, are, who think it's a legitimate project to criticize religion. It's been un, unfashionable to criticize any one religion more than any other. Yes. And I've I it, noticed- Especially one any more than any Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, you can go to town on, on Mormonism or Scientology. But, um, it's, or uh, Christianity, actually. I mean, the default assumption is that if you're against religion, or if you if you think that the the evidentiary claims upon which all these revealed religions are founded are unjustifiable, well, then they're all on all fours together, yeah. and you don't really need to weight your concern. But it it just see, has seemed obvious, at least since September 11th, 2001, that one of these religions is producing more than its fair share of conflict and, and oppression. So the, back to the question, how do you, given that you and I both think it's legitimate to focus on the most harmful instances of religion as we see it, how do you avoid energizing those voices who are actually animated by bigotry and xenophobia? Yes, and yes. Well, I think we, we both have this, this problem. I suppose... Um, I mean, I listened to one of your podcasts about, about um, 
his Islam and um, arguing against the point of view which says that the, the, the terrorists which, um, which we all know, know about in the Middle East are not motivated by religion. Hmm. Um, they're motivated by anything but religion. There's a kind of desperate desire to blame anything but religion for what, yeah. is, what is going yeah. on. Um, I, this I this was the podcast where, where that issue of ISIS's magazine, Dabiq, where they just spelled out. They, they, they were as fed up with this as I was, and they just wrote <laughs> all of their reasons for killing infidels. It was amazing. It was, I, I felt like I was in a lucid dream. That, that <laughs> It's true. I, I do, do listen to it. What, what's it called, Sam? I forgot what it's called, but you'll find it. It's, it's it, sometime in the last ten podcasts. You know, I think what... Sorry? What jihadists really what, what, what jihadists really think. Um, and it's, it's, it's why we hate you and why we fight you. Yeah. And yeah. it's absolutely... I mean, Sam could have written the script. It's, it's just completely... Um, we hate you because you're not Muslim. It, it, it amounts to nothing more than that. Yeah, yeah. And, we, and we fight you for the same reason. Um, but, but, so, but what do you do? Actually, so I, I had a podcast that I just released today where I was interviewing our, our mutual friend, Ayan Hirsi Ali. Yeah. And I asked her a related question. Yeah, thank you. This is the, the true feminist hero who was just declared an anti-Muslim extremist by the Southern Poverty Law Center. That's absolutely unbelievable. But since I and, asked her... And has been disinvited by, by at least several campuses in this, in this yeah, country, including yeah. Brandeis. So I, I asked her more to the point of, of conspiracy thinking on the right. So, so it's often... It, it is it's simply a fact that Islamists and jihadists are scheming to spread their views and you know both by the sword and otherwise throughout open societies and they're using the norms and institutions of of our open societies against ourselves in a very cynical and calculated way and it's not even a conspiracy as ion pointed out it's, it's just there in the open this is an agenda that, that islamists have they're totally open about it totally honest yeah, about it. yeah yeah but the the issue is you can take this, one's, one's concern about this, in truly paranoid directions. So I, I hear from people who think Ayan is a stealth Islamist or jihadist. I hear from people who think that Majid, who I wrote Islam and the Future of Tolerance with, is a stealth Islamist and jihadist. And so there's no, there's, there's no obvious signage on the way to complete insanity that, you know, where you're <laughs> told that you are now too fearful and too concerned about things that actually are contiguous with real, you know, real reasons for concern. So, but I asked Ayan, so how, where's the boundary here? What, how do we differentiate a reasonable fear about genuinely scheming people and right-wing paranoia in this case? And she just said, facts. Just one word. It's like you're either talking about facts or you're not. And when you're talking about facts, you, you can't go wrong in this space. And that's, I thought that was a great answer. I think one point to make is that the, the, the main victims of these awful people are actually Muslims themselves. Yeah. Um, um, but what about the, the attack from the left, which, which in, in liberal left circles in America and Britain, where Islam gets a free pass on all sorts of terrible things like misogyny, which, which no liberal would actually sanction. And yet, mm. if a Muslim behaves in horrifically misogynistic ways, somehow that's ignored, as though yeah. that's somehow legitimate. Oh, it's part of their culture, so they're allowed to do that. I must say, I, I despise that kind of thing. I, I... Well, there was some, I think it was an, anth I think it was an anthropologist whose quote this I'm about to butcher, but it's, it's a great point. He said, when when one person grabs a little girl and cuts off her clitoris with a septic blade, he is a dangerous lunatic. When a million people do this, it's a culture and we need to respect it. And that's, that's the little crystal of moral confusion that's just at the center of, yes. of the, the liberal worldview that, that we need to I fully agree. 
I, 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 I dare to suggest that there's too much respect in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> hold on to that. <laughs> is the concept of race biologically valid, or is it merely a social construct? Oh, gosh, right. And, and, and what do you think about taboo topics in science, for instance, racial differences in IQ? Are these taboos justified? Are there things we shouldn't study? Well, f first, I, I, I can't imagine any good reason for wanting to study uh, racial differences in IQ. Um, but as for the purely scientific question of is race a valid biological uh, thing or is it a social construct? Yes, it is biologically valid. It's a valid distinction. There's a widespread belief that it's purely a social construct. This has been abetted by the very distinguished geneticist Richard Lewontin, who made the point that um, the great majority of uh, well, first of all, made, made the point that the human species is astonishingly unvariable compared to many other species. We are genetically a very uniform species, despite what we look like. Um, and the great majority of variation can be found across races, not, uh, sorry, not, 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 between, not between races, but within, uh, but within them. Um, Nevertheless, um, the geneticist, equally ge distinguished geneticist, A.W.F. Edwards, pointed out what he called Lewontin's fallacy, which is that although there may be relatively little variation between, between geographical pe peoples, nevertheless, it is correlated. So um, a simple operational d d distinction if you were to take um, people from Uganda, um, Alaska, or say Inu Inuit, um, from uh, the Congo forest, uh, from India, from China, and um, ask anybody in the world to guess where they came from, given a list of countries where they might have come from, everybody's going to get it right. You can tell where somebody comes from if, if, they, if their ancestors have lived in a certain area for a long time. Um, it's very easy to tell. It's not, it's not difficult. It's, it's, it's dead simple. There, there, there really are geographical differences between, between peoples. What is deeply wicked is to base any kind of discrimination on those things. Um, you should never, ever discriminate against somebody because of their skin color or anything else. That, that's wicked. But to deny that there are differences seems to me to be perverse. Well, let's take that. You can, you can retract those applause after I say what I'm about to say. <laughs> so, but the, but the, the implication of, of natural selection here is that if you have isolated populations, populations that are sufficiently isolated so as to give rise to phenotypes that differ sufficiently so that we notice we're in the presence of what we're now calling two different races. It would be an absolute miracle if everything about us that we care about, that is selected for, was identically tuned across those different races. Yeah. I mean, intelligence, you know, good psychological characteristics, generosity, conscientiousness, aggression. So, so you, undoubtedly, we will find differences that we can generalize about if we look for them. And it's the fear of what that means, the implications of that, that I think yes. make, make, make um, this a taboo. You, you, can, you can probably find them, but, but what, would be, what would be wicked would be to say, I will not give this person a job because he belongs to this category of people. And there's some kind of statistical tendency for that, for that category of person to be different from that, from that category. Treat them as individuals. Treat them, yeah. Look at the qualifications of this individual and forget about the group, race, whatever you want to call it, uh, to, to which he belongs. That's where Lewontin's point about variance is relevant, because given that the, given that the variance, there, there's enough variance within a population for all of these characteristics yeah. that it would be irrational 
to think you know a lot about a person's Quite, whatever exactly. mathematical ability based exactly. on their race, even yeah. if there were a, a population difference yeah. between two populations. Totally right, yes. But can, can you see, so I, I recently did a, a podcast where this topic came up and I got a lot of pushback from my position, which is very much like yours, where I just, I, I don't see the point of doing this research. What good is going to come of scaling intelligence in many different populations? But I guess there's no guarantee that, that there isn't something worth studying there that would be a, just, just understanding human intelligence in general and the genes that maximize it. We may just stumble into these differences and, and wind up categorizing them despite ourselves. Yes. I, I see no, no objection to studying whether there are genetic differences across the whole human population in intelligence or musical ability or mathematical ability or anything else. I, what, what I would object to, I think, is, is categorizing somebody as belonging to this race or that race and therefore assuming that he is or is not good at mathematics. Or yeah, well, that, I mean, that final assumption, obviously, you, you would never want to make. I mean, it just would make no sense to make yeah. it. But yeah, it is, I mean, it, this kind of science, if we ever had these results in hand, would lend itself so clearly to, to invidious comparisons between yes, people I that it would it'd be a political yes. liability. But yes. that's, again, that's, that's on the assumption that we know we're going to, going to find negative comparisons in a way that would be disadvantageous to certain minority groups that we want to protect. But maybe, in, in many cases, it may be the other way around. You know, it may be that, that I mean, for instance, there was this great result, I think it still has stood up, that white Europeans are the only ones walking around who are part Neanderthal, right? Aren't we? Well, n n not, not white Europe, I mean, non-African. Non-Africans, okay. So, but it's also, it's also Asian? Yes. Okay. So yeah, so so the people Africans are the only true oh, yes, home, not, not 100 percent Homo sapiens. It, it, no, it could be Europeans. That, that, that could be right. Yes, right. Well, I'm, I'm proud to have Neanderthals. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, but I, I don't see I don't see um, anything wrong with say doing twin studies on on intelligence. I don't see anything mm -hmm. wrong with with saying uh, let let's look and see if there's a genetic component to intelligence. There's almost got to be a genetic component to intelligence because um, if you think that intelligence has evolved by natural selection over the past couple of million years and you know, we've got presumably we're more, more intelligent than, than Lucy was, that must have come about through natural selection and there must therefore have been genetic differences in intelligence to have been naturally selected. It seems to me that if you're going to go to the mat for eyebrows, you can't really draw the line at yeah, intelligence. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So the sort of al almost religious um, aversion to talking about uh, genetic differences in, in t intelligence is irrational. And I suppose it does come from the fear that it might be applied to groups of people rather than to individuals. Yeah, yeah. I, I think those taboos make some sense. I, I just wouldn't want to... I mean, we just we have to be able to talk honestly about the the intellectual real estate. But given a, a functionally infinite number of things to study that are interesting, I would question a real zeal for studying racial differences along these so lines. Would I. I mean, just yeah. and and it's easy to see why one would question that. And yet there are, I think, totally honest and ethical people who are still doing that work on, uh, in some sense. I, I, I mean, I, I, if, if I were on the National Science Foundation grant giving committee, I, I, I wouldn't give a grant to study that, because I, I, I don't see why it's interesting. Okay, yeah, I, but I, I guess my concern is that it's, it seems to prejudge in advance that nothing of general utility would come out of it. Yeah. So it's, and I, I I think I'm okay. We're, we're I don't know. I don't that know that where we wound up on that, but we're both in trouble with somebody. <laughs> what are your thoughts about how wealth will be distributed as our society grows more and more automated, and human labor becomes less and less valuable? Depending on how we deal with this issue, what kind of utopian or dystopian scenarios do you envision in the future? I think that's a question for you, really, isn't it? Well, I have an opinion on it. Yeah. It's interesting to, to meet economists who, or people who think they're economists, 
who think there is some law of economics that rules this out as a possibility. So uh, many people who, who have s looked at the history of economics think that there's some rule here that where technology never fatally cancels any area of human labor or human labor in principle, people just move on to the next jobs that have been opened up by these breakthroughs. So it used to be that some significant percentage of Americans tilled the land, but once we got machines to do that, that has now diminished to a tiny percentage of the population, but those people just moved on to do other uh, presumably more gratifying work. And there's this idea that that's going to happen, just going to continue indefinitely, but when you, when you extrapolate from the kinds of gains we're now making with intelligent machines and in automation, there's just, it, it seems obvious to me, and I, I really have not heard a good argument against this, that at some point we will be building machines that are capable not only of, of manual work, but intellectual work, and so capable of it that there is n never a space any longer for a person to occupy to do that work. So you know, self-driving cars is a, is a great example. It's something like 9% of men in this country drive for a living. It's, I, mean, that's, it's, I think it's the actual mo most common form of employment for men, or it might just be white men. Um, but it's, once we have self-driving cars, and just imagine this, and we bring down the, the fatality rate from 35,000 people a year to 500, say, so that it just becomes a, a, an absolutely stark and undeniable choice between the slaughter of tens of thousands of people or not due to ape-driven cars. We will, you know, we will not allow the apes to drive cars. <laughs> and it se seems to me that in the limit, almost everything is like that. Then what you're left with is this, this possible utopia, really, where we have just canceled the need for human drudgery, and we've opened a space where everyone should be free to do what they find most gratifying. And it's, it's a, you can be as creative as you want, you can, you can be as lazy as you want, you can have as much fun as you want, but the thing you have to break in order to make that possible is this ethical connection or pseudo-ethical connection that, that many people feel in their bones, especially in America, between working and having a right to exist, right? So it's like you have to, you have, to have the political and, and ethical wherewithal to spread this wealth. And so what I worry about is, I, mean, I think we would ultimately get there if we don't annihilate ourselves with AI in the meantime. But I think that there's, there'll be this transitional, if you imagine the perfect development of, of technology, there still will be this, this transitional kind of bottleneck where we won't have the, eth the ethical and economic and political pieces in place, and you'll get some ghastly level of wealth inequality that, that is just of a sort we can't really imagine, certainly in the developed world. And those spasms you know, politically could be very difficult to to absorb, so. Yeah, that's fascinating, I hadn't thought about that. And again, it, it extends not just to menial or, or physical work, I mean, it's, you know, you, we, the, the best biologist at some point will be a computer. It's not, it's, it's nowhere written that, that it's only chess that gets conquered by the machine. <laughs> this is a very common question, it's a, it's a question for which I'm sure we don't have a totally satisfying answer, but this is, if anything, this, this is the, the center of the bullseye with respect to the life horizon of atheism and the, the future of religion. How do atheists find meaning in life? Can there be a sense of the sacred in a truly rational context? How does anything matter if there's no heaven to go to? That, and that final, <laughs> that final line is, so the first, the first two sentences seem really kind of level-headed. <laughs> But this, to, to the religious mind, this final question is just as pressing as the first two. This is where my, my intuitions sort of fail. I, I, I've never understood this idea that without eternity, nothing matters. It seems to me you could, all, you could just as well run it the other way. If in, in light of eternity, 
Certainly, whatever happens here doesn't matter. I mean, we have an eternity to make up for this catastrophe. <laughs> so, I mean, if anything, life becomes, each moment of life becomes more precious given the fact that there's no promise of eternity. The trouble of being on stage with Sam is I agree with everything he says, and so, and so I, <laughs> um, uh, and I, I mean, I completely agree with that. The, the, the idea that anybody could think that there is no point in life if there's no eternity to go to. I mean, what a pathetically inadequate person that must be. <laughs> um, you, who, you, you have to make your own meaning in life. And, and we, we do that. I mean, we, 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 we love each other. We listen to music or write music. We, we do science. We are spellbound by the beauty of nature, by the beauty of the universe, by the beauty of the Grand Canyon, where I've just, just been. Um, th this gives you meaning in life. Meaning in life, the next book you want to write, the next baseball match you want to win, if you're that way inclined. Um, Baseball match, just... <laughs> Apologies for this uh, comparison, but that, that was the moment that, that should have ended Donald Trump's career, with the, at least with the Christians, when, when he stood up and pretended to be this, this devout Christian and said, my favorite book of the Bible, Corinthians 2. <laughs> But nothing was riding on that happily, and your reputation is intact. <laughs> Don't you worry, though, that the, the juicy things in life that religious people are afraid to lose are, if not hard to capture by a, a piecemeal secularism, they're not captured in a way where we can just point them to the replacements. So the, this, this community, that people have by, by virtue of gathering every Sunday to worship the, the, the off-the-shelf rituals. You know, when it comes time to get married or, or bury a loved one, they have language that is ready-made to do this. Doesn't it strike you as a, as a problem that, that accounts for why it's, it's, we haven't just changed people's minds? I don't, so, think it, I don't think it occurs to you, really, does it? I mean, d no, I mean, it, it occurs to me in, in the sense that it's... Uh, Religious people continually advertise the inadequacy of, of a worldview that doesn't have these things. But I, actually, I've experienced the problem. I mean, if, if I imagine someone in my life dying suddenly, I would have more work to do to figure out how to, to honor that occasion. Well, we do that, don't we? I, I mean, I, I, I've organized several funerals. You, you may have done. Um, I haven't, but, but, uh, but still, you're, you're, you, in there, you're kind of you're reinventing civilization for yourself well, to some measure, but, right? But if, if you think about funerals you've been to, um, I've been to many church funerals where there is also a eulogy or two eulogies where there is perhaps music played by a string quartet, mm. as I had for my father's funeral. Um, and the bits that you feel moved by, the bits that you feel are worthy of the memory of the dead person, they're never the prayers, they're never the bits that the, the vicar intones, who, just the standard formula, the sort of ritualistic formula that he trots out for everybody. They're when somebody stands up who really knew the person and reminisces about the person and moves you perhaps to tears thinking about the person, the music, the favorite music of the, dead, of the dead person, the poetry the dead person loved. This is what's moving about funerals. And I've, I've organized funerals of my father for the great evolutionary biologist W.D. Hamilton. I organized his funeral in New College, Oxford mm. Chapel. And um, I, I had about four different people talking about his achievements. Um, I found that, that there had been an anthem composed for Darwin's funeral in Westminster Abbey, uh, especially for the occasion. And I think it's never been played since, but I, I went to the British Museum Library, dug out the manuscript copy of this, of this anthem, 
gave it to the choir master of New College Oxford and he rehearsed the choir. They sang this uh, anthem that had never been sung since Darwin's funeral for perhaps possibly Darwin's greatest 20th century mm. Mm. successor. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not really very impressed by people who say that religion gives you rituals that you can't re re replace. You can replace them. Um, and you can replace the best parts of them and ignore the worst parts of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do, do you feel, though, that there's a, a need to systematize that so that th it's not upon everyone's shoulders to do this for themselves? Well, I think it's, it's almost an obligation to, to try to do something for a loved one who dies or for, uh, for, for a marriage or, mm. or for... Um, you could you could imagine other things. I mean, a, a coming of age ceremony. You could yeah. you could you could imagine. Um, by the way, for my funeral, <laughs> I want to have um, Verdi's um, Elephant March. Hmm. Do you know what you know the tr the trumpet? It's triumphal. If I hadn't had my stroke, I'd sing it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Please talk about the primacy of free speech for maintaining the standards of education and the openness of a society. Why, in a contest between freedom of speech and religious sensitivity, must free speech win? It's amazing that this is not, this really is not obvious to most people. I mean, it's amazing to hear freedom of religion and freedom of speech talked about in this society as though there, there had to be a balance struck between them, as though there were some use of speech that was itself an infringement upon someone else's freedom to practice their religion, which is yes. obviously not, never, never the case. Right. There's absolutely nothing I could say about religion right now that is so disparaging of the project that that would cancel someone else's ability to practice their religion, right? So it, it's just, there is no trade-off between free yeah, speech I and... T I, t I totally agree. And, and I'm distressed at the at the uh, disparagement of free speech, which is, which is creeping into universities both in Britain and America. I was in Berkeley in the 1960s, Berkeley, the, the home of the free speech movement, and it's immensely distressing to me that Berkeley today has disinvited people mm. um, because... <laughs> because, the, because of the fear that a speaker might hurt the feelings of some uh, religious people on the campus. What a betrayal! The people at Berkeley and in London, the London School of Economics and uh, various other places, mm. like I think Leicester University, Birmingham University, should hang their heads in shame for destroying the, 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 the fundamental principle of what a university should stand for. A university should stand for not just free speech, free, freedom of thought, the ability to be challenged, the ability to, uh, uh, to, to be exposed to views that you find distasteful, so you can evaluate them, not be protected from them. <laughs> A playpen full of Play-Doh. Kittens and puppies. <laughs> Safe spaces. Well, on that note, we are open to your questions. So. <laughs> yeah. I think there are, there are microphones coming to you. Uh, this question is directed to both Mr. Dawkins and Mr. Harris. Um, there's been a question going around in my mind about the authenticity of what counts as a follower of a specific umbrella religion, say Christianity, Islam, or Judaism. I've been in some discussions with some people as to the subject of Islamism, for instance, um, using Christianity as an example, asking an individual, is a Catholic a Christian? Is a Lutheran a Christian? Well, what constitutes um, a real Muslim? A, um, someone who's more liberal, someone who's an Islamist, what's a real Jew? A, um, or, or someone who falls before Judaism, as opposed to the more orthodox interpretation of the religion. 
What's your view on how an individual is a quote unquote an authentic follower of religion, given that religions have crossed a vast amount of time and space from their origin, from the point of origins to have evolved to include liberalistic interpretations and the what we would consider more fundamentalist. I mean, this is one reason why I'm a fan of zeroing in on specific beliefs and their consequences. So it's not trying to find the, quote, authentic Muslim or authentic Christian is a, I don't think it's a project anyone needs to ever be engaged in. You, you just need to know what someone believes on points that really matter. So you know, how do you think gays should be treated? You know, how do you think women should be treated? What do you think happens after you die? Do you think there's a paradise that martyrs go to? I mean, these are all these are all crucial questions, which you know any adherent of, of any one of those faiths will use in their own mind as a litmus test to judge whether or not someone is devout enough or following or interpreting the scripture the way they're doing it. But I don't think we ever really need to know. I mean, there's just there's just radical diversity, and there's, yeah. there's a range of commitments that we never really have to we never have to bound in any any. No, I, I, I agree with that except that. Um, Politicians may, I mean, this arises in Britain particularly, where actually in the, um, every 10 years we have a census and people are invited to tick a box as to which, which religion they belong to. And, um, and, and, and quite a large number of people in the 2001 census ticked the Christian box. It dropped from 72% to about 54% in the 2011 census. But, you, you, you might say, well, who cares whether they're really Christian? Who cares? I mean, it's up to them whether they, they, they really believe Jesus was the Son of God or Jesus is your Lord and Savior and were born of a virgin and things. But it does matter when politicians, who after all commission the census, make use of the figure 72% Christian. So they write, Britain is a Christian country, therefore we need to mm. pass legislation in accordance with Christian beliefs, and say about abortion or something of that, of that sort. And this actually did happen in Britain. So when my British foundation, the, uh, the British branch of the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, we, we actually commissioned a, a, a poll in Britain on the day, on, in, in the week after the 2011 census, to ask people who tick the Christian box, what do you really believe? Because we suspected that although they tick the Christian box, they didn't really believe in many of the tenets, by the way, it's tenets, not tenants, as was said mm -hmm. um, uh, of, 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 of Christianity. Um, and the, the reason we thought it mattered was precisely that politicians had used the figure, 72% Christian in the 2001 census, um, to enact legislation in accordance with what they thought were the beliefs of the British people. So I, I do yeah. think that, that to some extent it does, does matter. Uh, that's people... why the, the Pew, the, the polling organization, often does a religious, yes. religion survey and they ask specific questions. They don't ask as many as I would want them to ask, but they ask questions that tease out the gradations of belief. You know, how old do you think yes. the universe is? Do you... Yes. And by the way, the, the, the result of our, of our poll was that the people who tick, tick the Christian box, very, very few of them actually held the sorts of beliefs that you might think were Christian beliefs, like Jesus is my Lord and Savior, virgin birth, the Bible is true, uh, that, that kind of thing. I have a question for Sam. I'm curious, what are your views on medical marijuana for the use of children and elderly, as far as Parkinson's and epilepsy are involved? Well, I hadn't heard of its utility there, but if it's useful, I have no problem with it. I mean, I, I think it's... It's a drug that has a range of, of effects and, and some of them are good. And so if, if the, the question seems to presuppose a, a reason to stigmatize marijuana over any other you know, pharmaceutical someone might be given. And I don't really see that. So. Um, hi, I'm curious when you were talking about uh, measuring or studying intelligence across different races, um, what Specifically, because you mentioned IQ, what specifically would be the measurement of intelligence? You know, considering that people are interested in different types of intelligence, like emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. like how would you determine what is the proper way? What's
what's the standard for the, you know, the, what's the universal standard for intelligence, I guess? Is that the IQ test or? Yeah. Well, I, mean, for, for, I, think, I think both of, both of us say we specifically did not wish to measure intelligence across different races. Um, Although he, he was however, a little more emphatic than I was on that point. Yeah. I think. <laughs> however, um, but I, I mean, your, your question is a, is a valid one with respect to measuring intelligence at all, which, which I would be in favor of. There are lots of different ways of measuring intelligence. As you say, lots of different kinds of intelligence. And IQ tests themselves are very controversial and they measure different things. But whatever you measure, you can measure it. And then you can look at genetic differences yeah. in it. It doesn't matter that you may, you may find different genetic effects in this kind of intelligence or that kind of intelligence. And um, when, when I said that uh, human intelligence must have increased during the last two million years, I wasn't bothering to dis differentiate whether um, that, that was the, with the, this test of IQ or that test of IQ. It doesn't matter. I mean, any of them, you could, you could, once you've got something you can measure, then you can look at genetic differences mm -hmm. in that something. But I think one aspect of that question is whether IQ is valid. And I, I think the, the research suggests that there is such a thing as general intelligence and that IQ is, is a pretty good measure of it. It's a pretty generalizable result and it's correlated with the things you would think general intelligence would be correlated with. But uh, yeah, I, I'm also a fan of the multiple intelligence description of the human mind. IQ obviously doesn't measure everything about us that we care about that produces creativity and certain forms of genius. And so I, it's, it's not the whole measure, but it, it is something. And you'll meet many people. It's, it's certainly politically correct to say that IQ is a fiction or that the tests are invalid or that they're culturally biased. And my understanding of, of the research at this point is that that's not true. Hi, my name is Mark. Uh, thank you both for coming here tonight. I really appreciate seeing you here. Uh, I agree with so much of what you two said. And I felt it a duty, knowing, feeling like I know you, you want me to think of something to kind of challenge you. The best I can come up with is this. Uh, Richard, tonight you, you mentioned that as people we make up our own meaning, what, what things you mean. And uh, Sam, you mentioned tonight and previously that uh, beliefs have consequences. Now, considering the reality that most people across the world are not as well read as you and don't really think and ponder so much as a lot of us do about the meaning of our beliefs and the meaning of things. I have this question for you on religion. Uh, so many people throughout the ages picture a man. He lives his life. He makes his meaning based on the religion he's been presented from a young person. And he finds peace in that. And a lot of the dogmas and beliefs of the religion he's presented, he may not really subscribe to. He doesn't read all the texts and think about it that much. But he finds peace in it. So my question for you is, what's the harm? I know beliefs have impact and beliefs have consequences. So my question for you is, what's the harm of an individual or so many people throughout the ages who live their lives finding peace, having religion, live and die and believe as they do. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I actually, there is a, something that will be familiar to many of you that I think is worth saying at this point, which is the problem with dogmatism is that you, you actually can never be sure what the harms will be. And they can be astonishingly bad all of a sudden. And the state of being dogmatic, the state of believing things strongly despite an absence of evidence or even in the face of counter evidence, that is the state of having no error correcting mechanisms in your worldview. I mean, you're, you're simply not available to reality. So you are just going to continually bump into hard objects wherever you go. <laughs> and so you take, and my favorite example of this, and I, I just, I should have said this several times, but it's just worth pondering that 
You can have a dogma which on its face is the most benign and life-affirming dogma there is. So the dogma that life starts at the moment of conception and all human life is sacred, right? All of it is sacred. We just cannot, we just have to privilege just the human being from the moment of conception as being an entity that, is, that has to be treated as an end in itself and never as a means. Now, what harm is going to come from that? That is the most life-affirming and most careful disposition you could possibly have. But then we get something like embryonic stem cell research. Or then we have the, 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 the family planning needs of, of women and girls who get raped, right? And then all of a sudden, the people who are sure, based on pure dogmatism, that a, that, that a soul that, that, if you could hold it in your hand, would be invisible to you, if you could hold a thousand in your hand, they'd be invisible to you. Those souls in those fertilized ova are just as important as the souls in this room, right? That's a, a, a dogma that, that's responsible for an immense amount of harm, and yet you wouldn't have foreseen it. And so the problem is, to have a way of thinking about the world that doesn't allow you to reliably navigate because you are not basing your, your worldview on evidence and argument. That, that's, that's the problem, and it's, it's By always the way, um, A good way to tease people who think that, uh, that, that the soul enters the body at, 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 at conception is just confront them with monozygotic twins. Um, which twin has the soul? <laughs> And which, which twin is, 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 the, is the zombie? I mean, so, <laughs> so, Sam is, of course, perfectly right. There are all sorts of unforeseen evil c c consequences. But I, I have another answer to, the, to the, this very, very well thought out question, which is that I'm not sure that I really care whether it does harm or not. I care about whether it's true. And, <laughs> And e even more strongly than that, I care that children are brought up denied access to the very, very beautiful truths which we are uncovering, science in particular is uncovering over the centuries. Um, we, we live in, a, in a, a wonderfully privileged century from this point of view. We live at a time when not everything is known, but an enormous amount is known. And it's, one of the, it's a great privilege of those who live, who are born in this century, to, to be told what we do know about the world, about the universe, about life, about how we come to be here. And it always makes you weep to think of children who are being deprived of this by ignorant, bigoted parents who are teaching them nonsense. Because it's, I don't know, because it's comforting or because it comes down through the family, it's their tradition, it's in the... It's in the holy book. I mean, that, that, what a tragedy for the children concerned to, 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 to live their lives deprived of the wonder of knowledge. To what extent is our DNA what? Destiny. To what degree are you really bounded and determined, you know, you're in, oh, in right. succeeding in life based on, on just your genetics? <laughs> well, I, I, to, to, the, the short answer to this question is that virtually everything you care about seems to be half genetic. I mean, the, 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 bound, the boundary between nature and, and, and nurture is is, is just kind of a convenient and, and misleading fiction. I mean, everything that is a matter of nurture is affecting you by virtue of regulating the function of genes. And I mean, so, so you know, if you're going to remember anything about what I say now, it's because genes have been transcribing in your brain and, and you've been laying down new connections and, and, and re changing receptor densities. And I mean, so it's just, 
it, there's, a, there's a physical mechanism and it's related to your genetics at every point, and that is, that is how your environment affects you. So there is no clear boundary there, but a 50% is, is a ballpark figure for almost everything like intelligence or you know, strong personality traits that are obviously genetic, which is to say that identical twins reared apart will be importantly similar, you know, correlated to and to 50% in those respects. And there's some disturbing research that suggests that the other 50% is really not a matter of what the parents do. It's much more, I mean, the nurture is coming from friends, it's coming from the culture, it's coming from happenstance, it's not. The similarity of, let's say, genetically unrelated people raised in the same home is very small, and in some cases, non-existent. So that is very depressing for parents, or liberating if you screwed up. Um, it, it, it is, it is, it is um, you, can, you can measure heritability, which is the contribution to variance of various factors, genes and various other, other factors. And, and twin studies is a good way of doing it, uh, comparing fraternal twins with, with identical twins. And for some characteristics, it's, it's more than 50%. For other characteristics, yeah. it's less than 50%. It may sort of average 50%. Um, so I, th I think it's interesting work to do, and, and there are some fascinating twin studies that have been done, often exploiting the, uh, the, the, the rather rare cases where, for reasons of for rather unfortunate accident, identical twins have been reared apart. It does happen, not very often, but there are a few dozen cases which have been studied. And in some cases, identical twins reared apart are uncannily similar. Um, in, in, for, in, for some characteristics, in, in, in other characteristics, they're not. And you can use fraternal twins, both read together and read separately, as controls. So it's quite a neat sort of, not exactly experimental design, because it's not deliberately engineered, but it's quite a neat design um, for measuring heritability, which is this, fun this quantity, which is the proportion of, va of, of, of variance which you can attribute to genetic variation. Mm. Mr. Dawkins? My question is for Richard Dawkins, and uh, I'm going to try to format it uh, in a way that people can understand it. So, I always sit, one of the thoughts that I always have when I sit down is I like, I will, I think about human species in the long term. And one of the, the, the flaws that I see is that, uh, is in the field of medicine that these pharmaceutical companies like to develop customers instead of cures. And uh, recently, especially in technology and space travel, we're talking about going to Mars and colonizing another planet. But I feel as though this has to be addressed first. The question, do you think the medicine industry will blossom into the type of industry that is actually trying to help the human species rather than create clientele. Thank you. I, 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 I mean, I don't want to be cynical about this. I, I, um, I, I'm, I'm aware that there are people who are very cynical about the pharmaceutical industry, and I don't really think I know enough about it. Um, I, I, um, I admire the medical profession. I like doctors. I'm, I'm glad to live in a society that has doctors and, 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 and hospitals. And um, I, I, I suppose it probably is true that, that you could probably accuse pharmaceutical companies of being manifested by commercial interests and, uh, and not exclusively concerned for human welfare, but, but um, I really don't know. I, I know too little about it. I feel like they, they have been impressively hobbled by the now requirement that they put all the side effects in their television ads. <laughs> have you seen some of these ads? Who, who is asking their doctors to prescribe these drugs where, when the, the litany of side effects are far worse than the disease? <laughs> And these are terrifying ads with some uh, a smiling woman who's talking about anal leakage and, <laughs> and, and the 
It's a horror show. We cannot end on anal leakage. Hi, thanks a lot. I just have a quick question regarding your talk or conversation on terrorism. Do you think if there was economic equality and an equality of standard of living throughout the entire world, terrorism would go down? No, no, no. The, the, the question is is there a correlation between economic inequality and terrorism? And if economic inequality went down, would terrorism go down? Well, the, the only data that exist on this that I'm aware of show the opposite correlation, in fact. It's not the poorest of the poor who are terrorists or most supportive of terrorism, I mean, to speak specifically of the jihadist variety of terrorism. And in fact, when you see the biographies of the people who are most involved in these organizations, you see engineers and you even see doctors, and these are not these are not peasants who graduate from being the cleaners of latrines to members of al-Qaeda or, or ISIS. And as you correct for literacy in the Muslim world, support for, for suicidal terrorism in defense of the faith goes up. So it's just not this, this li liberal dream, and I'm sorry to, to use the word liberal in, as a pejorative, but it, I mean, it, this is an instance of the delusion that this liberal dream that if you could just spread more economic opportunity and more education around that would by definition nullify these the, the scariest variants of religion that, that's just there's no there's no sign of that being true and you can see there's just an endless number of examples where it's not the case the the the, the issue we have to grapple with is, is that some ideas are so captivating that people even with a, people with a lot to live for, who are psychologically sane, who have lots of opportunity, who may ha already have families, and even young children, they think it is worth killing other people in defense of these ideas and, and dying in the process. And it's, the examples of this are, are endless, and that's, that's the, the fact that we need to, to grapple with. One of my favorite quotes from Sam is, these people, really believe what they say they believe and how difficult it is for us who don't believe anything very much to, <laughs> to, to understand how powerful that can be. If you enjoyed this podcast, there are several ways you can support it. You can leave reviews on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you happen to listen to it. You can share it on social media with your friends. You can discuss it on your own blog or podcast, or you can support it directly at samharris.org forward slash support.